Hello and welcome to another edition of Hot Topic. Today I'm joined by Keith Hunter, the Police and Crime Commissioner for the Humberside Force. He was elected last May, defeating his Tory rival Matthew Grove. Keith stood on a Labour ticket. He is himself a former, very senior policeman, a chief superintendent? That's correct, yes. Um, having served with the police on Humberside and other places for 30 years or so. He is now no longer a serving officer, but as commissioner, our representative in governing the police. Keith, welcome. Thank you very much for, for being here. It's a pleasure. Uh, first of all, I just want to try to clarify some of the things that you said in your campaign for the PCC ship in May. Um, you mentioned uh, community policing and community control of policing. Uh, both uh, words that seem familiar and friendly, but I'm not entirely sure what either of those phrases mean. Well, I think, well, I meant by it, and I think most people recognise by community policing are the PCSOs and the neighbourhood beat officers that work a particular area all of the time and deal with the issues raised by that community rather than being deployed to calls for service all of the time. So when I talk about community policing, that's what I mean by that. And in terms of passing control to uh, communities, um, having those discussions with the force and with local authorities about a gradual movement towards trying to give communities more power through uh, recognised routes to identify their own priorities and ensure that the police then pick up those priorities and deal with it. Is there not a danger? For, well, first, let me take that point about community policing, more bobbies on the beat, as it were. Um, does that actually prevent crime? Does that reduce the figures of crime? My view is that there are uh, huge benefits from having visible patrolling officers on the streets. And I think there's an arrogance about those who say that there are no benefit towards it and assume that they understand what the public need and desire when the public actually cry out for something else. If the public say that is what we want, they say that for a reason. It isn't old fashioned to have patrolling officers. For every patrolling officer uh, you can have potentially hundreds of people that see them. Take that away and there are a proportion of people who will start over a period of time to break the law. Just the visible presence of police officers creates an atmosphere which has a knock-on effect much higher up the scale of criminality. And I am a big believer that if you withdraw those from communities, communities really feel the, uh, the effect of that, if not immediately, eventually. Well, in that case, risking arrogance, I'll ask again, does Bobby's on the beat, does that reduce the crime figures? I not, absolutely the not the perception of the public, but in the statistics, does I it reduce the crime absolutely. figures? Absolutely, but what I say, this is uh, what you get is a build-up. So you get police withdrawing from the streets so there are no visible presence there unless there's a call for service. That then allows those people who have a, a predilection for perhaps pushing the law to its boundaries to start behaving in a way which they recognise as being uh, tempting the police to come and inter interfere with that. If those police officers aren't there, they will raise that bar and they will continue with the antisocial behaviour that moves into low level criminality, which moves into high level criminality. So I think absolutely, yes, that is the case. Crime is rising at the moment and I think police withdrawing from the streets right across the UK is one of the main reasons why that has occurred. That is not quite the same thing, having police on the streets and uh, not tolerating low-level crime, because low-level crime generates higher-level crime. Uh, they're not quite the same thing, but with that idea of, of not tolerating small crime, is that a sort of uh, a following in the footsteps of Rudy Giuliani's uh, policies in New York about 10 or 15 years ago? Uh, or more than that, in the late 1990s, when uh, absolutely, you know, you st stubbing a cigarette out on the pavement would find you'd find yourself in, in a night in the cells. <laughs> Is that the same philosophy? Because it worked in New York. Well, the broken windows policy, it was as it was called in New York, has been translated by some into zero tolerance policing. There's no such thing as zero tolerance policing. It's just a slogan. What I believe in is the fact that communities want to see and believe that visible presence on their street actually is a, a, a contributing factor to safer communities. I believe that. I believe it suppresses crime. And I believe it suppresses antisocial behaviour. Now, I also believe that if officers are on the street and they see any activity which is a breach of the law, they should confront that and deal with it. I don't necessarily think that they should prosecute everyone, but they should never allow 
criminality or the breaching of the law to occur in front of them and not take a step to, to deal with that because that builds up this view that the police are not willing to take steps to maintain the law and that's what they're there for. That preventing crime or responding to crime without necessarily having a prosecution, that sounds, if you speak to a lot of, well you'll know more than I do, but if you speak to any retired police officer over about 60, they'll be regretting the days when he didn't give a, a young chummy a slap round the back of the head and tell him to be on his way. Well, actually, it's generally members of the public who say that rather than police officers, in my experience. I haven't spoken to any police officers that have ever admitted to giving someone a slap well, around the back of the head. they wouldn't because you're an ex-chief superintendent, <laughs> but they do to me. <laughs> well, that may be the case, but I think that was some time ago. Things have moved on since then. There are different approaches. What is important is that the police interact with the communities that they serve in a way that gives the communities confidence that the police are on their side. And I'm a big believer that the police are on the side of the law abiding and they need to make a so. visible statement of that by being out on the streets and uh, interfering with those who disrupt the ability of others to have a, a peaceful life. On the idea of this community control of policing, that different communities might have different priorities and that the police might be doing, might be policing different activities in those places, what does that do to our idea of being equal before the law and equal before a common law, a common law that, 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 that the writ of which runs throughout the realm, if the law will be uh, enforced in one place differently to the way that it's enforced in another, uh, we're not equal before equal laws? Well, I think you're taking a principle and stretching it to the point where it doesn't apply anymore. Policing has always been about prioritisation. There are simply not enough police officers, certainly now, to deal with every single thing in the tightest possible interpretation of the law. So there has to be choices made. What I am keen to do is ensure that communities' priorities are reflected in the priorities of the police. And it isn't just the police making decisions based upon strategic direction coming from central government there around where they place their activity because so I think there needs to be some of that obviously because of, there are high level threats but if we ignore what communities want the police to do in their own communities we create a gap between the public and the police and that gap becomes very dangerous in terms of maintaining law and order because gaps never exist very long the vacuums are filled they're either filled by vigilantes or they're filled by criminals I don't want that I want the police to be there Let's just move on to something more specifically about the Humberside Force. That there's been a big restructuring going on for, I don't know, what, the last year or so, uh, in, and changes in the force under the Chief Constable, uh, Justine Curran. Uh, it was, on the whole, supported by your predecessor and the, as Commissioner, Matthew Grove. How's that restructuring going, and how's the morale of the force? OK, well, the restructure uh, is, is a process of change has largely concluded. What is going on at the moment is a process of examining the effects of that and making changes around the margins to try and ensure it actually works better. Uh, I mean, during the campaign, I was quite clear in that I didn't support the reorganisation that had been carried out, but that's looking backwards. We've got to look forwards now. I think uh, the force moved to a very pure model away from a geographic model that had previously been based there, what they call a one-force model. There has been some... Uh, retreat from that and there's a lot more geographic responsibility built in now. So and that's uh, are you have returning effect. to divisions? Then? No, and, and I wouldn't suggest that that is the right move. Be because of the huge number of cuts that the police have faced, some change was required. Now, uh, what is uh, currently in play is a bit of a hybrid model between a pure one-force model and divisions where there is some geographic responsibility uh, uh, but there is the, the ability to move resources around the force much more so than there was previously with the old geographically based divisions. And how have officers responded to this? What, what's the feeling in the, uh, in the CADs? Well, I think it, it was well uh, publicised, the fact that morale in Humberside Police was the lowest in the country, according to uh, Paul carried out by the Police Federation. Obviously, that was of concern to me. No organisation ever performs to its maximum if it is, doesn't have an engaged workforce that, with a good morale. So, obviously, if I want to ensure that Humberside Police delivers to its fullest extent, I want to ensure there is good morale there. So I'm speaking regularly to the police staff associations. Uh, I'm speaking to the chief constable. I'm looking at the processes that are being put in place. 
and there has been huge turmoil in Humberside Police over the last 18 months. There is some stability coming in now. And my feeling is that that morale is starting to uh, bottom out and start to increase in places. But I am carrying out an in, uh, quite a big staff survey in November. It's going on, sorry, now, actually, we'll report in November, which uh, will look at the attitudes of police officers and staff right across the organisation. And on following on that, I will carry out some... Uh, focus groups to really get under the skin of that and find out what are the issues that are really affecting morale. Keith, we're going to have to stop there for a break, but we'll come back in a moment to talk about some of the responses to the, the information yeah. that you'll get from that survey. Join us again in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. I'm still with Keith Hunter, Police and Crime Commissioner for Humberside. Keith, you were just saying that you were doing a survey of opinions and responses and reactions and morale amongst the force. That's reporting in November. All very well you knowing how the officers feel, but uh, do you make any undertakings to respond to how they feel, to do as they ask? Well, I'm not a big believer in doing things for no effect. So if I'm carrying out the survey and putting money into that, the idea is that we actually put an action plan in to address the issues as a result of that. So I'll work with the chief constable to make, constable to make sure that we do that uh, as a result of that, yes. Before I go on to talk more about resources, uh, have we lost, has the Humberside Force lost its helicopter? It hasn't lost its helicopter. It, it was on a contract. It came to the end of the contract, so the helicopter went back. Uh, and it, we've become part of the National Police Air Service now, which was a, a mandated requirement, i.e. the government said that every force must join the National Police Air Service. What was allowed was some space of time to do that, depending upon the commercial uh, contracts that forces were tied into around their own helicopters. I sleep better now that it's not hovering over my house every night in, in central Grimsby. Uh, not that I'm sure it wasn't doing a wonderful job. Let's talk about money. Central government's where most of your money comes from. Though some of it comes off the council tax. Uh, you, like everybody else, don't feel that you have enough. Uh, the Lincolnshire force next door has, is going through something of a crisis in terms of its uh, money and whether or not it can continue to police um, and much dramatic rhetoric coming uh, from the south. Uh, how are you getting about uh, the most efficient use of the resources that you have and perhaps more importantly getting more of it out of the new Chancellor of the Exchequer? Okay, well in terms of best use of resources, during the campaign I recognised that the force was sat on a large pot of reserves, much bigger than a public service should really hold on to. Uh, it was sat on 30 million pounds of reserves, and really, uh, even a conservative estimate would say sort of six to seven would be very uh, careful uh, stewardship of the resources. So there was a lot of money there, which had built up over the previous few years. Now, what I want to do is ensure that a public service given money to deliver public services uses that money to do that. So I'm developing a plan with the force that uh, will ensure that additional resources over and above the funded level uh, on a permanent basis are brought in in the short term, so that's additional constables and PCSOs uh, which are being recruited at this moment in time which will go straight into community policing. So there's an immediate uh, addition into the very front line of policing. I'm then working with the Chief and Deputy Chief Constable looking at the business processes of the force to ensure that uh, all of the efficiency plans are delivering against schedule and that there is a route to track all of those efficiencies so I can ensure that they go into delivering the priority areas for the force. Business planning and policing isn't necessarily flavour of the month, but it can make a huge difference to what is delivered at the front end. We, as taxpayers, <coughs> we don't really expect our public services mm. to have a surplus. Uh, and you've got a £30 million surplus. You're saying that you're spending that on service, services uh, above and beyond the, 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 the strictest uh, funded yes. by income, by revenue, as it were. Uh, I pay council tax. A large part of that is the police fee. I pay income tax and every other sort of tax, and a large part of that goes to paying for the police through central government. You've got 30 million sloshing around in your account of my taxpayers' money. Can I have it back, please? Oh, well, firstly, you don't pay a large part of your council tax towards it. It's a very small part of the council tax. And I think if you look at what you pay... It's small proportionately to the rest of the council tax, but it's still a big chunk of money when you're writing that cheque every month. OK, well... Perhaps uh, you could look at it that way. What I think is you look at what you, what value you get for what you pay. And if you look at uh, the services that Humberside Police 
deliver on a day-to-day -day basis, I think you're getting very good value for money. In terms of uh, the, the reserve, that is one-off money, can only be spent once. What the council tax does is add to the revenue budget. So the, the council tax adds to the number of officers that Humberside Police can plan to have into the future. The reserves can be used for a limited period of time to front load uh, any kind of project or uh, attempt to increase service delivery to the public. My view is that there is an opportunity over the next few years to use that to give an additional boost to very frontline delivery to those communities that feel as though the police have abandoned them. That's what I want to do because that's what I think that money is there for. I will still look to increase the revenue count so I can plan over the longer term to increase the number of officers in the force depending upon what money the government gives me when they come out with their funding settlement. If you were to increase, I mean, there's a, there's a point at which you can, there's a, it's a, a bottomless pit, isn't it? There's, there is no amount of money that would be too much for a police force to have. There is no number of officers that are too many uh, for a police force to have. Uh, at what point is uh, the Humberside Police Force big enough and well enough resourced? At what point is, is there, there's no possibility of zero crime uh, in, a, in this fallen post-lapsarian world. Uh, at what point would you be satisfied? I mean, realistically, if we look back to where we were in 2008, we had about 2,200 officers and we built up to around about 300 PCSOs. Now, when the uh, austerity budget started biting, any police force would say, yes, there are room for efficiency savings. What that amounts to, I would have said, that you probably could have taken out about 100 to 150 officers and not noticed much of an effect. We've lost nearly 500 officers, sorry, 700, nearly 700 officers since 2008. I believe that has a massive effect on what's uh, able to be delivered. Now, I would like, realistically, to see that move back up towards the 2000 mark again. However, I think in, re in reality, what will happen is that the government will come out with a, a statement soon which will indicate their direction of travel with the new Prime Minister. And until then, it's very difficult to plan uh, around where I would like to see that number go. I want to see the number go up. Make no bones about that. I would like to see it over uh, the next decade move back up towards 2000. In the short term, if we can get to 1600, 1700, I think communities would feel a real difference. I just want to move on and ask about your own office. Um, you're the second uh, uh, commissioner of the Humberside Police that you were elected during the second round of elections for this very new office, yeah. uh, our, our newest democratic office in, in this country. Uh, recent news is that in your neighbouring force of South Yorkshire, the, uh, the Police and Crime Commissioner Alan Billings has effectively sacked or sort of required the resignation of David Crompton, the Chief Constable, for what Alan Billings regards as regrettable comments he made. Um, in response to the Hillsborough verdicts uh, in April, for the inquest of Hillsborough in April. Uh, had you conceived of the commissionership as a position from which uh, you can sack chief constables? Had, had that been part of the purpose of the, of the commissionership when, when it was designed? I think absolutely that is the case, yes. And uh, it was the process for a commissioner to be able to get rid of a chief constable. There's two routes you can go down, but one of the routes was specifically designed to, in effect, make it the commissioner's decision. If a commissioner loses confidence in the chief constable, there is a process to go through, but the reality is that the commissioner will get rid of that chief constable. It can be challenged in court, but there have been some judicial reviews of this, and the judicial review suggests that, actually, if a commissioner loses confidence, that's it. Just to, for the record, at the time of recording the chief constable of South Yorkshire, David Crompton, has said that he does intend to challenge the yes, Peace and Crime I, Commissioner. I've seen that, yes. But to talk about slightly more widely about the powers of the Commissioner, um, since you can dispose of the money and decide what the priorities are and where it's going to go, you could, for instance, simply decide that you were going to spend all the money on uh, enforcing the laws against marijuana, say, and none of it on enforcing the laws against um, shoplifting, for instance. You are effectively a legislator in that you can decide which laws will be enforced and which won't. That's an interesting proposition. I would say that I don't necessarily support that. Chief constables direct the operational uh, uh, policing effect. What a commissioner can do 
is state what outcomes they want, but they shouldn't really direct exactly how that's delivered. Now, they can have some influence with the Chief Constable, but I don't think any Chief Constable would put up with a Police and Crime Commissioner saying, you must concentrate in these areas. Uh, and they, th they might if they knew they could be sacked by the Police and Crime Commissioner. Well, I mean, that is a... a a situation which has to be felt with over a period of time and, and tested out. Certainly, uh, you can take any situation to its extreme and and go into what ifs. The reality is that police and crime commissioners tend to be reasonable people. Chief constables have been through a process of uh, developing their skills over a long period of time, or otherwise it wouldn't be a chief constable. And two people at that level coming together are not going to come up with a solution where they decide that they're going to try and subvert the law by just uh, applying it in certain circumstances. Well, I'm not suggesting subverting the law, but prioritising the law, that's all. I very much admire your premise there that uh, police and crime commissioners tend to be reasonable people. Speaking for myself. Uh, speaking for yourself, <laughs> no doubt, but this is a democracy and that's a subject, the <laughs> way of electing police and crime commissioners is something regrettably that we won't have time for. Uh, you stood on the Labour Party ticket and I would have loved to ask you what you thought of the events last week at the mm. conference, but I regret that we don't have time, Keith. Thank you Next time. very much. Next time, I look forward to it. Thank okay. you very much for coming on. And I look forward to seeing developments in the police. Thank, Thank you, Keith. Keith. Join me again next week when we'll have another hot topic.